Good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to the Georgia Tech Manufacturing Institute's Fall Lunch and Learn Lecture Series. My name is Billy D. Brown. I'm a research faculty and director of manufacturing education programs with GTMI. GTMI is one of 11 Georgia Tech interdisciplinary research institutes uh, that uniquely focuses on manufacturing research, development, and deployment. Uh, we help tackle the grand challenges of today's manufacturers and assist partners in moving innovations from the lab to the market. GTMI has a wide variety of facilities and equipment located on main campus for basic research and nearby on 14th Street for more applied research in our advanced manufacturing pilot facility. GTMI's mission includes education and workforce training, collaborate, collaborative partnerships with industry, academia, and government, as well as thought leadership. GTMI hosts the Lunch and Learn uh, series each semester. That's where we are now. And this fall sessions will be held every Monday at noon as live online events. Uh, these sessions are excellent opportunities for Georgia Tech faculty, uh, student um, researchers, undergraduate, graduate level students and researchers, as well as a global manufacturing community to learn and share advanced manufacturing knowledge. To ensure a smooth presentation uh, experience, all audience members are automatically muted. Uh, if you have questions or comments for the speaker, please use the question and answer panel. Uh, I strongly encourage everyone to submit their questions uh, as soon as you have them formulated, and uh, the speaker will address them promptly at the end of the presentation. Today, I'm pleased uh, to introduce Professor Chip White who will discuss impact of COVID-19 on manufacturing supply chain design and operations. Dr. White is the Schneider National Chair of Transportation and Logistics and professor in the School of Industrial and Systems Engineering at Georgia Tech. He was the former director of the AP Sloan Foundation Trucking Industry Program and the former, former executive director of the Supply Chain and Logistics Institute at Georgia Tech. While at the University of Michigan, uh, Dr. White founded, uh, was founding engineering co-director of what is now the Tauber Institute for Global Operations. He's a former member of the Board of Directors of Conway Incorporated and of the Board of Advisors of Freight Waves, a futures and options marketplace for transportation capacity. He is a current member of the Board of Directors of the Industry Studies Association. Uh, he's given testimony before the U.S. Senate Committee on Environment and Public Works, uh, the California Senate Committee on Transportation and Housing Public Hearing on Intelligent Transportation Systems, and the Joint Georgia State Senate, House, Senate and House Future of Manufacturing Study Committee on Trends and Challenges in Supply Chain Logistics and Engineering. In today's session, Dr. White will focus his presentation on the recent growing interest in supply chains and their role in delivering goods to the American consumer, in large part due to the impact of COVID-19 on American life and the stresses on supply chains that have resulted in reduced customer service levels. Dr. White will discuss approaches for strengthening supply chain resilience and agility, or the ability to quickly adjust to sudden disruptive changes that negatively affect supply chain performance with special interest in cybersecurity. Uh, Dr. White, you may begin your presentation. Okay, thank you, Billy D. Uh, thank you for that nice uh, introduction. And I'd like to thank uh, the Georgia Tech Manufacturing Institute for um, uh, allowing me to uh, give you my uh, impressions of the uh, impact of COVID-19 on manufacturing uh, supply chains. Uh, what I will uh, do in terms of outlines is, outline is to, uh, uh, give a brief overview of supply chains, uh, talk about supply chain cost and risks, and as Billy D indicated, uh, the growing interest in uh, resilience and agility in supply chains, and in large part due to the uh, coronavirus uh, uh, pandemic that we are, are currently uh, experiencing. Um, I'll give some very specific uh, issues uh, and impacts of COVID-19, uh, a whole series of them, and then uh, uh, end up uh, the uh, presentation with some final comments on 
cybersecurity automation and what we envision as next generation supply chains in large part framed uh, framed by uh, the COVID-19 and some other major disruption uh, experiences that we've had. <clears throat> With respect to an overview, um, basically the uh, extended enterprise is a, a network of independent country, uh, companies, uh, a, 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 a uh, original manufacturing, uh, uh, original equipment manufacturing company, an OEM, with suppliers who are coordinate uh, the uh, flow of goods uh, through a supply chain uh, that uh, hopefully produces a product that's better, cheaper, and faster to the market uh, than the competition. <clears throat> and the supply chain is the flow of goods uh, through the uh, uh, through the the system uh, from our. Uh, uh, raw equipment or, or uh, raw material uh, suppliers uh, all the way through manufacturers and uh, to the consumer. But it also represents uh, a flow of uh, information. We'll be focusing on that a good little bit. And the flow of money. <clears throat> now, specifically, uh, supply chain, um, for example, for dur durable goods manufacturing, uh, think auto, uh, there'll be suppliers who provide components uh, to um, the uh, manufacturer or the assembler who then uh, produces a final product uh, uh, that then is sent to distri uh, uh, distributors for sale uh, to um, customers. And uh, there are a variety of different ways of sort of, uh, of organizing this flow of goods. Uh, one is called uh, push methods of control. And uh, this is uh, uh, identical or synonymous with uh, mass production, uh, where uh, we uh, uh, essentially produce a, a, a long uh, line of, uh, or a, a large number of, uh, of uh, products uh, to take advantage of the economies of scale. Uh, and we may uh, end up with uh, too many or too few uh, uh, products uh, for sale that uh, might result in stockouts, or uh, uh, in some cases, uh, we may have uh, uh, products that we can't sell. Uh, typically, what happens with uh, mass production is we have a lot of inventory. Uh, we don't have to spend much on inventory, uh, in information systems or uh, transport systems. Another strategy, uh, supply chain strategy, is pull methods of control. This is similar to build to uh, build to order or mass customization, and basically what it requires is a uh, a very agile supply chain that adjusts very quickly to demand shifts in and the uh, interest in the product, and um, it uses uh, information system uh, information uh, and data. Uh, much more so than uh, the uh, push system or uh, mass production system. Uh, and it represents uh, perhaps a newer uh, form of uh, supply chain strategy based on the fact that we now have more uh, data to work with and more sophisticated information systems to use. Uh, there is flow of uh, point of sales data and other forms of data back up through the supply chain, and also uh, some material re uh, returns, uh, recycled products. This is the uh, reverse logistics that occurs in supply chains. Uh, suppliers uh, are multi-tiered. Uh, a first-tier supplier that uh, ships uh, components directly to a manufacturer often has suppliers themselves second tier suppliers, third tier suppliers, and so forth. Uh, and um, of course, the product itself is designed uh, in order to uh, be easy to manufacture, inexpensive to manufacture, and also designed to make sure that the marketer is happy with it and that it's going to sell. So that's a, uh, that's an, uh, off a very important part of the design of, uh, of a product as well. All of this is coordinated 
by uh, a third party logistics provider, an LP, uh, a 3PL, uh, that uh, coordinates the flow of goods from the supplier to the manufacturer to the distributor, uh, often is involved with point of sales uh, uh, data. Uh, uh, transmission as well, and returnables uh, back to the manufacturer uh, and or suppliers. Third-party uh, logistics providers are, are often logistics companies that uh, were or are, are still are trucking companies, uh, transportation companies, or warehousing companies. So this is a uh, what a, a, a supply chain might uh, look like uh, sort of conceptually with uh, two different kinds of supply chain strategies that we've mentioned. If we look at uh, supply chain systems designs, uh, what we see are uh, complex uh, uh, systems that uh, have similarities, but a lot of differences. So they're complicated and uh, the, uh, the differences are uh, very important and significant. We've already talked about push and pull systems, mass production versus build to order, but there are centralized supply chain networks uh, as well. Uh, and these uh, enable economies of scale. Uh, they allow for uh, inventory pooling, reduced total buffer inventory and reduced total uh, capital expenditures. Uh, but again, uh, they uh, may suffer more stock outs and more obsolescence. Distributed supply chain networks, which are something that have become uh, more and more of interest to uh, industry recently, uh, are uh, have their inventory and manufacturing uh, close to demand distributed with the intent of being able to uh, uh, enable fast fulfillment. These are the agile systems that we're talking about. Uh, the fast fulfillment is the Amazon effect. Uh, and we'll talk a little bit more about Amazon and the impact of COVID-19 on Amazon uh, in a few slides. Uh, we've heard about lean uh, supply chains, uh, just-in-time supply chains that uh, eliminate buffer cost and remove as much uh, waste in the uh, in the supply chain as possible, mostly uh, uh, inventory. Uh, and also try to take advantage of economies of scale. And lean supply chains uh, uh, really require uh, a level production schedule in order to uh, to work well. Very predictable demand, uh, which is something that you do see in the, uh, for example, the Japanese auto. Uh, but there are also agile supply chains for uh, supply chains where uh, demand or supply or manufacturing capacity is volatile. Uh, and these uh, require uh, a, a certain level of flexibility and the ability to reconfigure your network if need be uh, as uh, market conditions fluctuate. Um, these are uh, supply chains that are designed to, uh, again, to deal with uh, much more volatile uh, demand supply manufacturing capability than lean supply chains are. Okay, uh, just to uh, uh, go to uh, discussing costs, um, where are the costs? What are the long-term trends in minimizing cost in supply chains? Well, we've talked about lean manufacturing and uh, uh, removing waste, uh, lowering inventory, uh, re uh, reducing lead times, both for product and transportation. Uh, we've seen a lot in the last 20, 30 years, offshoring and outsourcing. Uh, Low-cost manufacturing uh, is uh, the reason for it uh, due to uh, low, lower wage rates and lower cost of raw materials in other parts of the world. Um, uh, of course, the, uh, this low-cost manufacturing needs to be uh, low enough to compensate for uh, longer lead times uh, and uh, longer or larger transportation expenses and also the uh, disruptive uh, uh, part of uh, usually minor disruptions uh, associated with crossing borders uh, and also the greater transportation risk. Uh, moving uh, goods from uh, Shanghai to the East Coast over the land bridge from a West Coast port, there are just many more things that can go wrong uh, as, as compared to, say, uh, moving uh, components from uh, uh, 50 kilometers away from Toyota City from Hamamatsu. Uh, and as a result of uh, the predictability uh, 
it goes down in terms of the these kinds of uh, uh, global supply chains. Another uh, minimizing cost uh, 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 issue follows from uh, data driven uh, uh, supply chains. We're uh, now using data. There's more data to use. Uh, it's coming in with a higher bandwidth. Uh, and it's uh, of greater variety now that uh, allows uh, data-driven real-time supply chain control to be much more efficient than it has been. Sometimes this is referred to uh, monetizing data or trading uh, inventory uh, for uh, trading information for inventory. Uh, so this is a also a major long-term trend uh, that uh, minimizes not only cost but uh, risk and other things. If we look to see uh, what strategy push or pull supply chains uh, strategies have been working or have been uh, becoming more and more useful, what we see are logistics costs. This is pre um, uh, pre Great Recession uh, logistics costs since 1980 to about uh, 2005. We see the percentage of U.S. Uh, GDP has come down, indicating that the logistics industry has become much more efficient in the United States. And uh, logistics costs really come in three forms, administrative, transportation, and inventory cost. Administration we can is so small, typically, that we can sort of uh, ignore it. Uh, and we see that in terms of percentage of U.S. Uh, GDP, transportation costs have really not changed. Um, uh, very much over this period of time, where the big uh, emphasis has been on has been in reducing inventories. Uh, and this is uh, the impact of the just-in-time uh, lean manufacturing uh, emphasis that's come out of Japan and Toyota specifically, uh, and how it's uh, really benefited uh, U.S. manufacturing and manufacturing all over the world. We also see it in um, uh, inventory to sales ratio. You see the the uh, after the uh, the pandemic as well. It's a little more complicated after. I'm sorry. After the uh, uh, the uh, Great Recession of 2008, uh, things get a little more complicated. But you see the uh, downward trend in this ratio of inventories to sales. We have lower inventories and we're uh, s selling more. That ratio is coming down. That's an indication that we're we have the, the right inventory in the right place, and we don't have too much inventory. Uh, during uh, recessions, of course, this ratio shoots up. Um, and right after uh, 2010, we see an uptick in this ratio. That has to do with the, uh, uh, the Amazon effect, the fact that we're distributing inventory uh, more and we can't take in, uh, into account uh, risk pooling in inventories. And then there was, in fact, kind of a recession uh, in the 2016-2018 uh, period, that uh, isn't treated by the uh, uh, by the U.S. Bureau of the Census here uh, as a recession, but in fact was in terms of uh, the logistics industry. So this is an indication also that we've really moved from mass production more to build-to-order mass customization. We see it in other uh, uh, data. Uh, we see the uh, uh, wonderfully efficient U.S. Uh, logistics industry uh, running a, a GDP percentage of uh, under 8%. Um, it's uh, considerably higher in uh, other countries. In the, in the uh, uh, EU, it's uh, about 10%. Uh, in uh, India, it's 16%. In uh, the uh, mainland China, it runs between 18 and 19%. Uh, it's an indication that we have a, uh, the United States has a, an efficient logistics. Okay, moving on to risks. In dealing with uh, global supply chain uh, risks, uh, we've already seen that uh, just-in-time supply chains can uh, are, are wonderful in terms of reducing costs, but they're fragile, and they don't degrade gracefully when uh, disruptions occur. Uh, a prime example of that uh, in the last bullet, uh, a major disruption that I'll mention is the Aishin Seiki P valve uh, factory fire in 1997 with Toyota. Aishin Seiki is a major supplier for uh, 
uh, in their Koritsu uh, in uh, Japan with Toyota. P-valve is a, an important component uh, in uh, brakes in automobiles. You've got to have a P-valve for brakes to work, and uh, cars need brakes. Uh, and uh, Aishin Seiki was the only uh, supplier of P-valves to Toyota, and uh, Aishin Seiki made those P-valves in only one uh, factory. That factory uh, burned to the ground, uh, and within two hours, the uh, uh, Toyota supply chain was uh, breaking down. Uh, assembly uh, plants were uh, uh, stopping uh, assembly, and uh, the entire system was down within two days. That's an example of a, a very fragile, the fragility of the uh, just-in-time supply chain. Uh, offshore uh, and outsourcing, uh, there, uh, as we mentioned, uh, there are many operational risks that were uh, really initially unrecognized uh, in uh, long supply chains. Um, and basically, the longer the lead time or travel time, the larger the lead time variability, and that has uh, put a greater emphasis on reshoring or at least uh, reducing the length of time, uh, the, uh, the, uh, the distance of these supply chains, moving supplier bases from Southeast Asia, for example, to Mexico. Uh, we've also, in large part because of the coronavirus, uh, seen uh, uh, a concern over over-reliance of foreign non-partner non uh, country suppliers for uh, supply chains that are associated with national security. For example, uh, the pharmaceuticals. Uh, uh, Southeast Asia accounts for over 60 percent of, uh, of exports of, uh, and imports to us in the United States of antibiotics, sedatives, and other, other uh, uh, medicines and pharmaceuticals. And uh, this has uh, uh, resulted in a, an interest in uh, strengthening domestic uh, supplier bases. Uh, a lot of discussion right now in Washington about that. Now, supply chains have been used to uncertainties, um, variations in customer demand, you know, seasonal or uh, during the week. Uh, there's always uh, a supplier that doesn't quite get the components to the uh, assembler in time. That occasionally happens. Uh, uh, their manufacturing equipment is not always reliable, and neither is the labor force. But these are uncertainties that have been experienced before and can, can be built into uh, most supply chains. The kinds of uh, uncertainties we're talking about are major disruptions like uh, extreme weather, uh, the supplier disruptions that I mentioned with uh, Aishin, uh, Aishin Seiki, uh, and geopolitical stresses, trade wars. Uh, uh, and if we're dealing with a variety of different countries, uh, different countries have different IP and regulation policies and, and laws. Uh, that can, uh, and they can change uh, very quickly without notification that can make a difference. And of course, pandemics, uh, specifically COVID, which will be uh, something we'll talk about directly uh, in just a minute. Well, okay, supply chains need a little more resilience and agility than uh, perhaps we uh, were lulled into believing uh, before we saw uh, a variety of different major disruptions. Uh, Gardner gives uh, six strategies for supply chain resilience, uh, and we'll be talking about most of them. What we mean by uh, supply chain uh, resilience and agility is, is the ability to quickly adjust to uh, sudden disruptive changes that were uh, not expected uh, that can uh, negatively affect supply chain performance. <laughs> and a um, a uh, McKinsey survey uh, of su senior supply chain executives uh, just recently, the last couple of months, have uh, indicated that 93% of these executives are now planning to increase the level of resilience across their supply chains. And this uh, survey uh, included a variety of different industries and a variety of different geographies, not just in the United States, but uh, in other parts of the world. Okay, well, how can we, or how does one, uh, strengthen supply chain resiliency and agility? Uh, well, one thing is continued use of real-time data for real-time supply chain control, uh, the value of information that we've mentioned a little bit earlier. 
it can be used to reduce cost, but it also can, uh, data can, and the, uh, the value in data can also increase uh, supply chain stability and mitigate risks. Uh, and uh, when we're talking about resiliency and agility, that's uh, risk mitigation, essentially. We can also uh, redesign our product and supply chain uh, to reduce lead times and increase agility. And uh, based on uh, uh, next generation data analytics that uh, we're hearing uh, a lot about uh, machine learning and so forth, uh, we can come up with more accurate demand forecasts and anticipate uh, problems that might occur. So these are uh, ways of strengthening supply chain resiliency and, uh, and agility too. But the major way is to build in redundancy. And that means uh, increasing inventory levels of raw material, work in progress, WIP, and uh, also the final product, adding manufacturing or storage capacity to improve surge capability after a disruption, sometimes you need to surge in order to satisfy demand. Um, geographically distribute uh, manufacturing or storage capability uh, to improve uh, resilience. I mentioned uh, fire protection. HP requires you to uh, put no more than a billion do uh, dollars worth of its uh, printers in a warehouse just to uh, make sure that uh, there's not an extreme loss in and what they have, uh, but also uh, the geographically distributed manufacturing allows for uh, variable exchange rates across countries and also variable demand across countries. Uh, you can increase the number of suppliers uh, of key materials, uh, work in progress. Uh, uh, and also you'd wanna, of course, ensure that your supplier base uh, is economically stable and is capable of surge, uh, surge if needed. Um, and also there's advantage in having your supplier base geographically distributed. An example of uh, nearshoring at least some capability and uh, the supplier base, General Motors, uh, they will have a low uh, cost supplier in, for example, uh, mainland China or Southeast Asia, but they'll also have a domestic supplier that's guaranteed uh, perhaps 10% of the building as long as uh, uh, of the uh, of the bill of uh, the the. Uh, the uh, order, uh, as long as they're able to, uh, uh, they have surge capability, just in case they lose that low, low cost supplier to some kind of a disruption, they'll have a backup domestically. Uh, but the reality is um, resiliency and agility are costly. And uh, this is the conundrum that supply chains are in right now. Uh, we want to build resiliency and agility in supply chains. We don't want to do it at a lot of cost, however, because we compete a lot on the basis of cost, the products that we produce with the supply chains. Okay, nearshoring. Well, the argument is that with trade wars and a pandemic, uh, it's uh, too risky for uh, multinationals to outsource to anything other than partner countries and, and also to stay as domestic as possible. But the reality is uh, uh, industry isn't doing this. Uh, industry um, is uh, uh, still uh, uh, investing uh, foreign direct investment in uh, the uh, in mainland China has continued to rise. We haven't seen a growth in uh, factory jobs in the United States. As, as a matter of fact, we've seen a, uh, a significant reduction in uh, factory jobs in the United States since 2016. Uh, and uh, while uh, US trade policy uh, has uh, made doing business abroad difficult, um, uh, we, uh, and due to the higher wages in the United States and the attraction of uh, foreign markets as a result, particularly labor costs, uh, most global businesses are choosing to remain global. And uh, they may be moving out of uh, mainland China, but they're uh, moving to Southeast Asia and Mexico and uh, other uh, relatively low wage countries. So a, a conclusion right now, at least, is uh, we're not seeing um, uh, reasons for uh, uh, these multinationals uh, to uh, 
to do anything other than outsource to uh, lay, low wage markets, uh, that uh, incentive to uh, globalize still prevails, perhaps less so, but still prevails. Let's move on to uh, COVID-19 and what we've experienced. Well, uh, three things I'll mention. Uh, we've seen surges in uh, customer demand for some supply chains. These are uh, ones that relate, are related to groceries and household products. Uh, significant uh, uh, increase uh, surges in some of these uh, products and dramatic decreases in customer demand for other uh, uh, products, for example, auto in the last uh, in the first uh, month of the uh, uh, the coronavirus, uh, uh, there was a 97 percent drop in uh, demand. Uh, so these are huge shifts in demand uh, in uh, for supply chains, virtually all of them. Uh, uh, and uh, these uh, and basically uh, supply chains are desi designed around demand. They're tuned around demand. With respect to surges in healthcare related products and equipment, uh, we've seen not only a surge in demand, but also the demand has uh, shifted geographically from hotspot to hotspot. They're initially hotspots around the West Coast, then they shifted to the East Coast, and they've, uh, and right now they're, uh, in the upper Midwest primarily and, and a little bit more to the, uh, to the, uh, West again. Uh, so, uh, here again, uh, Healthcare related products and equipment, the, uh, uh, the complications not only change in demand, but change in the geography of demand. Okay. Surge in online shopping as a result. And let's, what's the impact on, uh, Amazon? Amazon's added 400,000 jobs just this year to handle this surge. Uh, and it has grown in fulfillment capability, the, the ability to get things to your house by 50% just this year. Amazon was big to begin with, and look how it's grown uh, this year. As a matter of fact, uh, last quarter, third quarter uh, this year, uh, their sales jumped uh, to uh, revenues of uh, close to $100 billion. This is a huge growth in uh, their business. And yet we see layoffs in other countries, uh, companies, uh, um, Exxon Mobil, Disney, American Airlines, uh, many bankruptcies in, in retail, huge shifts in demand and, uh, which have caused these huge sh uh, shifts in industries and, uh, at the firm level, uh, for, uh, uh due to the, uh, coronavirus. Uh, e-commerce per percent, uh, uh, penetration percentage has just grown like Crazy. Ten years of growth in three months we've seen uh, in, uh, in terms of e-commerce. We've gone from about 15 percent uh, penetration uh, right before uh, the uh, new year uh, to uh, over uh, close to 35 percent uh, just in, in, in the first quarter of, uh, of this year. Uh, now, the uh, e-commerce uh, penetration uh, percentage in the U.S. is smaller than other countries. That uh, 15 percent beginning of the year is 25 percent in mainland China. Uh, but still, uh, we've also seen dramatic uh, growth in this uh, e-commerce penetration in other countries as well, but uh, dramatically in the United States. More people expect to make a, a portion of their purchases online post COVID-19. And this is a, a breakdown uh, of those uh, purchases, whether it's over-the-counter medicine or groceries or household supplies, um, consumer electronics, books, tobacco, whatever. Uh, we see uh, uh, expected growth uh, after the COVID-19. Uh, so uh, the post, uh, uh, the uh, pandemic uh, is really accelerating these changes that we have been expecting uh, and we can see the accelerating uh, acceleration most dramatically there in this this uh, slide okay fifteen to thirty percent uh we're seeing low touch activities these are activities where you uh, you uh, uh, restaurant delivery uh grocery delivery uh, meal kit delivery also dramatic increases as a result of uh covid nineteen uh and this is uh the uh B2C, the business to consumer, 
uh, uh, last mile delivery, uh, fast fulfillment uh, that uh, Amazon is noted for, the Amazon effect, uh, is being felt by uh, UPS, FedEx, DHL, uh, Xunfang Express in uh, China, mainland China, that's their uh, UPS, has also seen a dramatic increase in in business. Uh, for example, Xunfang, uh, they're traded on the uh, Chang, uh, the uh, Shenzhen uh, uh, stock market. Uh, their uh, stock has gone from, in U.S. terms, uh, about $40 a share uh, at uh, the turn of the uh, the year to about over 90 now. So uh, significant growth. And you've also seen significant growth in uh, share stock uh, stock shares in uh, uh, of the uh, uh, the integrated service providers that I mentioned earlier. Americans are spending uh, their time differently now, uh, and uh, how they spend their time is uh, reflected in demand of certain products, and uh, this uh, explains some of the shifts that we've seen. Uh, this slide here explains some of the shifts in, in uh, uh, demand that we uh, showed in, in the earlier diagram just uh, before this one. Uh, COVID-19 uh, has had impacts uh, on the various modes. This is uh, greatly oversimplified, but I thought I'd mention it because uh, we often don't uh, think of uh, transportation modes as, as part of uh, supply chains. They're very much very important for them. Trucking, uh, the demand shifts have uh, requ required uh, rerouting, uh, scheduling changes, and uh, even if you have a, a head haul, uh, you're not disrupted uh, as a uh, trucking company uh, to uh, move goods from A to B. Uh, in order for your uh, for hire company to be productive uh, and uh, make money, you have to have backhauls. But backhauls have been affected uh, significantly in trucking. Uh, uh, there's been a, a initially there was a significant drop in the spot market. Uh, lot, lots of bankruptcies. Um, the uh, bottleneck has been in the last mile just because of the fact that uh, e-commerce has grown so fast and the need for uh, moving goods from uh, retail to uh, the home instead of people going to retail to pick up things. Now they, they're, uh, uh, they're expecting Amazon and other, uh, uh, other last mile companies to do the delivery for them. For example, uh, P&G never really ran out of paper products. They had enough paper products for everybody, but uh, uh, we, we've seen where bathroom tissue and other uh, paper products in grocery stores, um, uh, it, it, it appeared that uh, there was a supply chain uh, problem, but really the, the problem was getting the products to retail from uh, the uh, distribution centers. Uh, Rail uh, volumes were down uh, significantly initially. A lot of it was due to the fact that uh, there were motor vehicles and parts that uh, people just weren't buying uh, cars and trucks. <clears throat> and as a result, they, there was a, a, lot, a lack of uh, petroleum products as a result. Uh, the, uh, uh, the oil industry took a dramatic hit. <clears throat> Intermodal demand plunged. Last mile delivery surged 10 times. <clears throat> Mention uh, Amazon stock price has gone up 60% in one year. Uh, it's an amazing story. And uh, we've already seen how uh, e commerce and last mile delivery has accelerated. Uh, air cargo, interesting impact here uh, in air cargo. It turns out almost half of the uh, air cargo is actually carried in uh, passenger planes. It's called belly freight. Uh, much of this capacity was lost because uh, passengers weren't flying. Uh, as a result, there were capacity shortages for air cargo and increased demand for air cargo, and, and as a result, uh, increased prices. Uh, uh, steamship lines uh, also suffered. Uh, demand was d d uh, down significantly. It's, it's right now uh, quite uh, uh, up uh, the demand for steamship lines and uh, costs have gone up because um, there are supply chain delays uh, as a result of labor shortages and other uh, coronavirus related delays. This is a very nice article in today's uh, uh, Wall Street Journal on 
uh, the impact on uh, steamship lines uh, of the coronavirus. <clears throat> okay, uh, moving on, uh, let me make uh, some final comments about some other forces that are affecting supply chains beside COVID-19. They're all interrelated, uh, but uh, uh, I'll uh, mention uh, cybersecurity and automation and then give a vision for next uh, generation supply chains uh, to, uh, to end the talk. Um, cybersecurity is a growing uh, concern, primarily because uh, supply chains are using uh, information or data uh, more and more and uh, the uh, increases in productivity that we're seeing in supply chains, uh, much of it has to do with the fact that we're able to extract value uh, out of data coming into these supply chains. Uh, and uh, uh, as a result, uh, the supply chain, uh, the cybersecurity risk has gone up. Uh, another uh, aspect is uh, additive manufacturing. Um, additive manufacturing uh, implies or it, in, in some point in times suggest not only information about uh, demand, but also uh, the need to uh, transmit uh, data that's product design data. So this is a dramatic increase in uh, uh, the flow of data for uh, uh, supply chains that, it, that involve additive manufacturing capability or capacity. Um, so as a result, uh, there is a, a really more uh, more damage that can be done by a cybersecurity breach. Um, a lot of smart people who uh, are uh, intelligent, adaptive adversaries also, and this is probably the most formidable uh, uh, cybersecurity threat, the intentional attack by an intelligent, uh, adaptive adversary who can learn. Uh, so what we need uh, in supply chains uh, and represent uh, uh, the uh, next generation uh, cybersecurity tools and techniques uh, to be able to uh, identify deceptions, anticipate and deter attacks. And if you can't deter them, um, uh, quickly detect it, respond to it, recover from it, and learn from it. And also uh, try to learn what your adversary also learned from it. So you're a little smarter uh, the next time you're uh, facing an attack. Uh, automation, uh, if, uh, if whatever component uh, or product can be made uh, by automation by a robot, uh, then uh, there's less of a reason to uh, offshore for lower wage rates. You can automate at, uh, at home or domestically uh, at, uh, at the same, uh, same cost, at least in terms of the automation is concerned. Here I just uh, show the annual installations of uh, industrial robots uh, in uh, the uh, 15 uh, largest markets in uh, uh, last year, primarily uh, China and uh, Japan, uh, the big uh, population uh, companies, uh, countries, but you also see the, uh, the Republic of Korea there, well represented. And uh, let's uh, go to the next slide and look at robot density, the uh, robots installed per uh, 10,000 employees. And uh, Republic of China is right up there, but the, the, uh, the biggest uh, uh, user of robots in terms of density is Singapore. Uh, they uh, have more jobs than they have uh, people, and as a result, uh, they need robots to uh, uh, make up the difference. So uh, we'll watch this uh, and see if uh, automation really has a significant impact in reducing the need to source offshore. Okay, uh, and with that, uh, uh, we can go to the uh, my last slide uh, and talk about reducing the cost of supply chain resiliency. Uh, next, next generation supply chains. What are they going to look like? Well, as we mentioned, uh, resilience is expensive, <clears throat> and we see uh, that uh, we need to build resilience and agility into supply chains. Uh, however, because of the cost, we see that competitive advantage will result if a firm's supply chain resilience and agility 
uh, are as certainly as good in terms of risk mitigation as the competitions, but at lower costs. So how can we lower the cost of resilience? And there are a, a variety of different uh, ways of doing this. First is inventory rebalancing. This is something that uh, uh, Amazon does all the time. It's called transshipment. They're moving uh, goods uh, from uh, where they're overstocked uh, to uh, areas of the country where they're understocked. And that uh, that transshipment uh, would be not only finished products, but also raw materials and work in progress. Another uh, advance, uh, uh, part of the solution that we are seeing and imagining are uh, uh, capacity rebalancing. This is actually geographically relocating uh, uh, production capacity or storage capacity. Right now, uh, Xinfang Express in Shenzhen is uh, examining the implication of storage capacity, moving it around geographically, and are, are seeing dramatic uh, ways of reducing uh, the uh, cost of last mile delivery as a result. And uh, so this is a, a, a new part of the solution that's being examined right now. The implications are that uh, the supply chain of the future uh, is going to uh, be, as we see it, blending the advantages of distributed supply chains in terms of enabling fast fulfillment, the Amazon effect, and central supply chain systems that uh, uh, enable economies of scale and uh, inventory and risk reduction and, uh, and CapEx reduction. And uh, as a result, supply chains that uh, will be resilient uh, may end up uh, being uh, either lean or agile, depending on need. And uh, this will be this, uh, what we envision as the supply chain of the uh, future, in large part motivated by uh, our, our, what we've seen about the impact of COVID-19 on supply chains. And with that, let me say thank you for listening. I uh, appreciate uh, uh, your attention and I look forward to answering any questions or hearing any comments you have. Uh, Billy, do you I'll turn it back to you? Thank you, Chip. Really appreciate uh, the presentation. I, I think you did a great job of just covering the, the fundamentals uh, from an academic perspective on supply chain and logistics and uh, giving us you know, a glimpse at the, the, the trends that are, have been trending in this field, um, as well as some, some of the possible uh, solutions really to, you know, the resilience and agility of the supply chain. Um, and I think, you know, I, I just want to encourage everyone right now, um, go ahead and submit your questions for Chip because um, I've had one question um, come in and I've, I've actually answered it already. It was about a recording. Um, but go ahead and submit your questions. Uh, but Chip, I, I really, I think that this is a great talk. Um, and a good segue for the remainder of our series. Uh, uh, since today we have a, a sort of an academic perspective on supply chain and logistics, the next two talks, uh, the next two seminars will be an industry perspectives. Um, we'll have uh, Alan Amling, um, who's the former VP of corporate strategy, VP of marketing for UPS Global Logistics and Distribution. Uh, we'll, we'll speak next week. Um, also, um, we'll, we'll talk about COVID's impact on supply chain uh, from an industry perspective. And then um, we'll also have, um, uh, we'll have actually a technical fellow from Boeing speak in two weeks, um, and really about the impact of industry uh, 4.0 on, on the supply chain uh, problems. Um, so this is a popular topic right now. Um, and we're, we're, we're definitely going to explore it in detail. Um, as of right now, Dr. White, I don't, I don't have any questions that are, are coming up. Um, I guess I, <clears throat> maybe I can try to start off a question here. Um, I did see, uh, you know, we were speaking about the, the trucking um, industry and some of it seemed to be a reduction in the demand. Um, at least I saw for some of these uh, transportation uh, industries. So, 
which I thought was was interesting because um, you know with with there have been surges in demand for specific products. So, but I guess overall, are we seeing a reduction in in, in actually the the trucking industry? Is that with this pandemic? Mm-hmm. Well, uh, with re- it depends on the part of the industry. Actually, uh, if you're talking about retail, um, most uh, you know clothes, uh, toys, uh, and so forth are moved on the ground or on on water because they're uh, they're not high cost per, or per, per pound, uh, and that would affect uh, the truckload industry uh, in the United States in terms of trucking. So there'd be a reduction in uh, uh, the amount of tonnage that's moved by uh, the truckload industry. In terms of uh, uh, durable goods manufacturing, uh, much of uh, that lo- those logistics from suppliers to OEMs are moved by the less than truckload industry. So uh, they would see uh, a reduction as well. Now, healthcare products tend to be uh, uh, often moved by air, particularly in emergencies. So uh, air cargo, uh, we see... Uh, uh, a rise in, in that and also uh, last mile fulfillment uh, 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 trucking that uh, would be more uh, UPS, FedEx. It'll be interesting to hear Alan uh, Aimling's uh, comments uh, next week uh, about the impact on uh, UPS. I'm sure he's kept up and it's been a dramatic increase. So uh, the uh, increases and decreases have been, uh, haven't been uniform uh, depending on the part of the uh, the trucking industry or the other modes uh, of uh, the logistics industry. Thank you, Chip. Uh, we had a couple of questions just now come in. Um, uh, first one is, how do you see the role of robots automation affecting human employment in future supply chains? I know for Singapore it is a necessity, so I'm curious about Europeans and American markets. Well, um, we, we're already seeing it. I mean, if you go into a uh, an assembly plant, auto assembly plant, uh, you don't see too many people. Uh, and this is true, uh, well, not only in the United States, but elsewhere. Uh, so y- you do see um, uh, robots uh, able to uh, replace uh, uh, human labor, uh, and you, we're seeing, of course, uh, robots also that are being uh, built that can work alongside humans, uh, which is uh, very interesting. Um, but um, the uh, talk, let's talk about uh, wage rates. Uh, that robot um, that uh, perhaps can uh, perform a certain uh, function in uh, Vietnam, uh, if it can perform the same function in, in uh, the United States, um, uh, w- the uh, wage rate disparity difference uh, is mitigated, is reduced. Um, and as a result, uh, as uh, I'm imagining this now or uh, hypothesizing it, that uh, the more uh, robotics uh, that we see, the more automation that we see in supply chain, uh, there'll be less need to uh, uh, offshore um, and uh, as as much as we have, uh, say in the uh, uh, in the late '90s and, and early parts of this uh, this century. All right, we have uh, more questions coming in. Um, next one. Uh, thank you for sharing your insights. This is from Professor Yan Wong. Could you please comment on the difference between resilience and reliability? Reliability emphasizes redundancy. Resilience appears to be not. Uh, there, there are well a variety of different uh, definitions. Uh, I didn't use a word robustness. Also, resilience uh, typically uh, means the ability to uh, sense a disruption. In other words, identify, detect it, <clears throat> um, uh, muddle through the disruption, and then recover from it. Uh, after uh, after it's over, uh, uh, reliability is um, uh, has to do with uh, you know the likelihood that whatever it is that needs to be reliable, like a uh, uh, a manufacturing uh, uh, a machine, for example, uh, breaks down. Uh, so uh, that uh, that reliability is Im- important. <laughs> In resilience, you certainly uh, do need your capacity. 
your production capacity, manufacturing capacity in order to remain resilient. Uh, so they are interrelated, uh, uh, but they are uh, different and distinct, but they are interrelated. Okay, <clears throat> thank you. Um, another question, could you please give examples on machine learning statistical applications on supply chain data, such as inventory, demand, et cetera, in order to enable supply chain agility during uncertain times, such as a pandemic? Oh, well, okay. That um, basically, uh, if you're talking about machine learning um, and uh, <clears throat> reinforcement learning, perhaps more specifically, uh, what you have is uh, uh, you have demand that's shifting. You, don't, you just really don't know what it is. I mean, if you give me a, a cumulative distribution of demand, I'm fine. I can, uh, I can tune my supply chain uh, around it. What I don't know uh, when there's a disruption is what that demand is going to look like. Uh, so I have to learn it. Um, and, um, you know, uh, various statistical data techniques that uh, um, uh, are referred to as uh, machine learning, reinforcement learning can be very helpful in uh, extracting uh, some, giving me some uh, uh, indication of what uh, demand is so that I can do some forecasting. Uh, so that's, uh, that's basically uh, uh, sort of the answer. Now, uh, just to go a, a, a little deeper, uh, if we talk about machine learning, it assumes basically the same kind of fundamental model that supply chains do, markup decision processes. Uh, but it assumes that you don't know anything about them. Uh, but with uh, supply chains, uh, you know that they are, part of them are inventory systems, part of them are production systems, and uh, you know uh, a lot of things about them. So a, uh, a blend of what you know uh, about the supply chain plus uh, machine learning techniques, uh, embedding some of this knowledge in uh, machine learning techniques and reinforcement learning, I think are, uh, Quite frankly, a, a very good foundational uh, direction to uh, for uh, academics to uh, work in. Excellent, excellent. Uh, next question: What makes the cost of business logistics in the U.S. more efficient than not only China and India but also Europe? <laughs> okay, uh, well, uh, we might get a little debate on uh, uh, Europe and the U.S. But basically, there. Uh, in Europe, what uh, what has happened is uh, at one point uh, the countries had their own uh, barriers, trade barriers, uh, and the, the EU has tried to reduce that. But there's still uh, laws called cabotage laws, where uh, if you uh, deliver, if you're a German uh, trucking company and you deliver in uh, Italy, uh, you can your backhaul is is limited, whereas it's not in the states in the United States. Uh, so, uh, and basically the trucking industry in, in the, uh, in Europe still takes on sort of a country, uh, focus. Uh, they're German, uh, German companies, French companies, uh, and so forth. And, uh, so, um, the, uh, efforts of the, uh, EU to reduce the trade barriers and the impacts of, uh, uh, of the legacy, uh, legacy laws, uh, language barriers and other uh, laws uh, are the cause of uh, a little, uh, a little less efficiency in uh, Europe. Uh, in um, if we go to India, um, what we see is a major uh, effort on the part of uh, India to improve its roads um, and also its rail system. Uh, any country that's uh, a former British colony has probably a well-developed rail system for moving freight. Uh, as India does. And um, a as a result, um, uh, the, uh, the Indian uh, logistics industry is becoming more efficient. But there are still uh, changes. Uh, you know, you go across different provinces in India and you still have uh, uh, taxes. Uh, uh, China, this is the same thing. Um, uh, China has uh, provinces that uh, uh, moving across borders, uh, the interpretation of uh, the size and, uh, and weight regulations in China, it varies from province to province. Uh, if you want to have a uh, national network in China, uh, like UPS and FedEx would like to have, 
um, uh, you, um, it, it's very difficult uh, because of uh, the, uh, the, the uh, different interpretations of uh, the regula regulatory structure in China at, in the uh, different provinces. So uh, those are the causes for some of the inefficiency from the logistics industry in other parts of the world. Thank you, Chip. Um, we still have a couple more questions, um, so I think I think we'll try to get those in, uh, even though it's okay. about one o'clock now. Um, if you if you don't mind, if you if you no, have time, no. awesome. I do. So, question from Bob Harbot, Harbot. As more end users start driving the endpoint logistics of supply chains, uh, for example, Amazon, do you see the potential for increases in security issues? Ah. Uh, yes, physical security, uh, absolutely, and uh, that's a um, an issue that's very important. Um, the uh, uh, cyber security is an important uh, issue, but when we have complex supply chains, we also have to consider physical uh, security. And um, the uh, uh, last mile delivery is a uh, you know potentially a weak link in uh, physical security for um, uh, supply chains, uh, no doubt about it. And that is a concern I know that uh, uh, is discussed. I don't see it written very much in um, uh, in uh, circles that are associated with uh, defense supply chains. Okay. <clears throat> we have uh, actually uh, a, a global <laughs> audience member uh, from the UK, uh, University of Cambridge, okay, uh, has a question here. So this is great because we're we're trying to expand our global audience. Uh, in the case of healthcare and food or other essential industries, is there a role for government to ensure supply security? Do we have useful frameworks to explore this context? Well, uh, that's uh, uh, I'll share my opinion, and the answer is, is certainly yes. Um, basically, uh, all firms, uh, their board of directors, uh, will uh, try to discuss how the firm can be more profitable and also how the firm can mitigate risk. Uh, but at the firm level, there's really no discussion about uh, mitigating risk at the national level for security reasons. So uh, as far as I'm concerned, there's a, a real need, a, a real place for government to uh, expand the conversation, uh, the dialogue, in terms of uh, risk mitigation uh, uh, for uh, supply chains that uh, have uh, security implications. Um, and uh, I, th I think that discussion is going on in the United States now uh, fairly significantly. Uh, and uh, I wouldn't be surprised if that's going on in the UK as well and in Europe. Well, thank you, Chip. Uh, really appreciate the presentation. And uh, thank you to our audience as well uh, for chiming in and, and, and actually asking a lot of great questions. Um, we're, we're actually a little bit over time. So um, I've already mentioned, um, you know, that we're going to remain on this topic for the next couple of weeks. Um, seems to be a popular topic. Uh, so please uh, tune back in um, at the same time next week, next Monday. and. Um, um, if you want to hear the recording of this lecture, uh, we, we post our recordings on the website at manufacturing.gatech.edu slash lectures. So the, the recording for this today will be reposted in a, in a few days. Um, so I appreciate everybody's time um, and uh, thank you so much for joining us. Uh, thank you. Everybody have a, everybody have a great Monday. <laughs>